Okay, picking up with um, the beginning of Antigone, page 792. This is going to be, I need to pick that up. This is going to be <clears throat> similar to all the other Sophoclean plays in that he will stick to the three unities. Time, place, and action. Um, with possibly one little caveat, because there's mention of going to the cave where Antigone is uh, entombed. Okay? So it begins with. The description kind of of the background, time and scene. Royal House of Thebes, night time. The invading armies of, Ar of Argos have just been driven from the city. Fighting on opposite sides, the sons of Oedipus, Eteocles and Polynices, have killed each other in combat. Okay? Eteocles defending Thebes, Polynices attacking Thebes. Sophocles also wrote a play called Seven Against Thebes, okay? which is these two um, Polynices and six other kings. All right. So it begins with Antigone, notice slipping through the central doors of the palace. She's sneaking out. She motions to her sister Ismene, who's also in the palace. She's not motioning to her somewhere off stage. And she says, Do you know one, I ask you, one grief? that Zeus will not perfect for the two of us while we still live and breathe. And that kind of encapsulates a lot of Greek thought right there. Right? Because what, is, what does that mean? Do you know one grief that Zeus will not perfect, bring it to completion, bring to perfection? Now think of grief. We kind of think of grief, an idea of completion is, the resolution of grief. For her, it's just the opposite. To bring grief, which might start out small, to its highest, greatest, worst pitch. There's nothing. No pain. Our lives are pain. No private shame. No public disgrace. Nothing I haven't seen in your griefs and mine. She's, she's not saying... We're at the bottom, and it can't get worse. She is kind of saying, how in the world can, get, can this get even worse? How will Zeus find a way to make even worse the grief and shame that we are experiencing? And now this. The, and now this. This is the new decree that Crayon has commanded. This is how Zeus, she's implying, has taken our little bit of grief and just multiplied it. Right. An emergency decree, they say. The commander has just now declared for all of Thebes. What, you haven't heard? The doom reserved for enemies marches on the ones we love the most. What's the doom reserved for enemies? Which isn't actually true, even in Greek thought. No burial. But she's implying, this is what we do to our enemies. Even in the Iliad, if we had read the Iliad, you would have seen... The Trojans bury their enemy dead, and the Greeks bury their enemy dead. It's when the Greeks don't bear, bury their enemy dead. Um, Achilles kills Hector. Uh, it's when the Greeks don't bury Hector that problems start to arise for them. Okay, Ismene, no, I haven't heard. Not a word. What are you talking about? Okay. What's the matter? Trouble, clearly. You sound so dark, so grim. Top of 793. Antigone. Why not? That is, why shouldn't I be grim? Why shouldn't I be dark? Our own brother's burial. Notice the apostrophe. Brothers, plural, apostrophe. She's saying the burial of both our brothers. Hasn't Crayon graced one with all the rights, disgraced the other? Who gets buried with all the rights? Full 
essentially a full military funeral. This is like Arlington National Cemetery. Hey, please. Why? He died defending Thebes. Polynices gets what? Left to rot. Because he died attacking Thebes. He, according to Crayon later, we will hear, and she doesn't mention it here, he's a traitor. Okay? Eteocles, they say, has been given full military honors, rightly so. Crayon has laid him in the earth, and he goes with glory down among the dead. But the body of Polynices, who died miserably, why, a citywide proclamation, rumor has it, that is, she's not heard it from her own ears from Crayon's mouth, forbids anyone to bury him, even mourn him. Okay, notice, that's not the proclamation part that I was talking about in the quiz, but that's saying, one, if this were the body, you can't sprinkle dust on it and pour out libations over it. That's the burial part. But nor can you even go look at the body and weep. So Crayon has outlawed what? Or tried to forbid what? Human nature. It's human nature to weep for a dead family member. And he thinks he can ban that. He's to be left unwept, unburied, a lovely treasure for birds that scan the field and feast to their heart's content. So skipping a little bit, she says, line 41, whoever disobeys in the least will die. His doom is sealed, stoning to death inside the city walls. So what's the proclamation? Excuse me. The two parts that I was looking for were Polynices will not be buried and anybody who tries will be executed. The third part is Ateocles gets a full military funeral. But that's already happened okay, by the time the play opens. So there you have it, she says. You'll soon show what you are. What does she mean, what you are? Worth your breeding, Ismene, or a coward, for all your royal blood. You'll show your true colors. Are you really of the house of Oedipus? Are you honorable? Which is, you know, kind of odd that she's asking this question when you think about the house of Oedipus. And we get a footnote later on that kind of takes the house of Oedipus and connects it with what? Pelops and the whole... Line of Atreus Agamemnon problem, okay? Ismene, my poor sister, if things have come to this, who am I to make or amend them? Tell me. What good am I to you? What does Ismene mean? Well, I'm just a little old poor country girl. What can I do about it? That's essentially what she's saying. I'm just a girl. <coughs> Antigone. Here's what you can do. Decide. Will you share the labor? Will you share, share the labor, share the work? That is, will you help me bury him? What work? Now, is many, is, is many really this dense or is she just plain dense? Antigone. Will you lift up his body with these bare hands and lower it with me? Will you bury him with me? You bury him when a law forbids the city? Right. You bury him when a law forbids the city? Yes, he's my brother. Deny it as you will. Your brother too. No one will ever convict me for a traitor. Notice she's thinking law court. Okay. There will be a trial. Crayon has expressly, he has no right to keep me from my own. Law versus what? Individual right? Or individual rights? 
or maybe is is it just the central conflict, the individual versus the state. This thing, I, um, you don't get much of an introduction. I think there is a little bit of one with Sophocles. This play has been produced, well, since the time of its production, but it was really popular. It was produced in um, occupied France, when France was occupied by the Nazis, right? by Jean-Louis, famous 20th century theater of the absurd, playwright, actor, director, etc. And it was pretty clear in that production, you can read about it, that Crayon stood for whom do you think? Yeah, Hitler slash the Nazis. Okay? Antigone stands for the French resistance. Not France, not France itself, but the French resistance. All right? He has no right to keep me from my own. Ismene tries to, to kind of calm down and slow down Antigone. She says, line 71, Think what a death will die. The worst of all if we violate the laws and override the fixed decree of the throne. Right? Its power. We must be sensible. That is, use some common sense. Remember, we are women. We are not born to contend with men. Okay? Also remember, this is not a woman writing this. This is Sophocles. Um, fully what? partaker of the patriarchal system of ancient Greece. He's not necessarily a quote-unquote, you wouldn't even call him, call him proto or paleo, feminist of any kind. But he is suggesting, okay, by having as many raise these words, that there is a distinction, there is warfare between men and women. Because we're going to hear when Crayon hears what happens and sees that it was Antigone, Crayon is, is essentially arguing against Antigone on the basis of one thing, really, which we'll talk about when we get to. So she says, think of how we will die if we do this. Moreover, we're women. We can't contend with men. They didn't have any rights, right? Then, too, we're underlings. He's the king. We're not. Ruled by much stronger hands. So we must submit in this and things still worse. Now, she's probably talking about um, sexual matters with the things still worse. Giving up our bodies to those we don't want to. She says, for me, what's she going to do? I'll die, not for burying Polynices, but when I die, I'll then go down to Hades and beg the dead to forgive me. She says, I'll go to Polynices and say, sorry, but, you know, what can I do? One, I'm a woman. Two, I was nobody. I can't oppose the state. I'm forced. I have no choice. I must obey the ones who stand in power. Why rush to extremes? The implication is, Crayon has taken an extreme position. Why must you go to the opposite? Be sensible. It's madness, she says. Antigone, no, okay, okay, fine. I retract my offer. <laughs> I'll bury him myself, she says. And even if I die in the act, that death will be a... Well, she introduces another motive for wanting to bury Polynices. Glory. Personal glory. The kind of glory men achieve... How? Battle. Going off and fighting in war. I will lie with the one I love and loved by him. She means lie in death. She's not necrophilia or anything weird like that. An outrage sacred to the gods. Notice, he, unburied, is an outrage. Okay? He is sacred to the gods. I have longer to please the dead than please the living here. Well, that's true, right? Because, you know, you're alive maybe this time period, 50, 60, 70 years. 
and you're dead forever <laughs> after that. In the kingdom down below, I will lie forever. Do as you like. Dishonor the laws the gods hold in honor. And now she raises the stakes. Now it's the gods versus the stakes. Okay. These two things, it can go back and forth, right? But when you bring the gods in, who's going to win? The gods never lose when it comes to dealing with humanity. Humanity can never pull a fast one over the gods. She uh, is many. I, I do them no dishonor. Okay, what's the apostrophe D? It's contraction for would. I would do them no dishonor. And in English, that would, if you tra trace it back to its original meaning, it means desire, wish, want. I desire, I, de I wish, I want to do them no dishonor. I don't want to dishonor the gods, but, you know, divide the city. What's, what's the calculus going on in her mind? The gods are when and where. They're out there. They're down the road a bit. The city? It's right now, man. She's saying, you know, I can deal with the gods later, but I, I can't. Antigone, you're so rash, she says. Linking her with their father. Don't fear for me. Set your own life in order. They don't at least blurt this out to anyone. That is, okay, so if you're going to bury him, don't tell anybody that you did it. Keep it a secret. Dear God, shout it from the rooftops. Antigone's saying, not only will I bury him, I'm going to put a sign. Antigone was here. You know. I did this. I'll hate you all the more for silence. Tell the world. So fiery, it ought to chill your heart. In other words, you ought to be scared to death to do this. I know I please where I must please the most. Who is she saying she must please the most? The gods. Okay. As meaning uh, 115 or so. Then go a few miles, but rest assured, wild, irrational as you are, again, linking her to Oedipus, my sister, you are truly dear to the ones who love you. And the chorus comes in, glory. Now, the chorus sounds like it's talking about the sun. Or is it talking about glory and it uses the sun as an image of that? Look at one for, line 140. Zeus hates with a vengeance all bravado, the mighty boasts of men. Why does the chorus say this? Okay, it's talking about those who attacked Thebes in that stanza. You know, he watched them coming on in a rising flood, the pride of their golden armor ringing shrill. It's talking about Zeus saw the army of Polynices approaching Thebes. Okay? He hates with a vengeance all bravado. All bravado is not just the boast of men, it's not just this coming army. What other bravado have we already seen? Antigone saying, I'm going to do this from hell or my water. i got to please the gods. Well, isn't saying you know what the gods think a little bit of bravado? I mean, isn't that implying I know the mind of the gods? He goes on. The chorus goes on. And Zeus, seeing the army coming in, Brandishing his lightning, blasted the fighter just at the goal, rushing to shout, rushing to shout his triumph from our walls. And you got a footnote telling you who that is, Capaneus. So what happened to his glory, Capaneus? Shot down. Why? Because Zeus's glory is foremost. But now his high hopes have laid him low. And down the enemy ranks, the iron god of war deals his rewards. That is, Ares is now slaughtering the attacking army. And the two brothers 
meet and kill each other. And then Crayon walks in. 173 or so. But look, the king of the realm is coming. Crayon, the new man for the new day. In other words, the old days have passed away. It's a new dawn. It's a new beginning. It's a new world. Kind of like the house of Oedipus. Finally, Thebes is washed clean of them. Because Crayon is not a descendant. That's all I mean by that. Whatever the gods are sending now, what new plan will he launch? Why whatever the gods are sending now? Well, Crayon's going to be the one to deal with whatever problems arise. Why, why this special session? Have we been told there is a special session? We have just in that question. Crayon has commanded the elders of the city to gather. Why the sudden call to the old men summoned at one command? And Crayon gives a long speech, and we've got to discuss the entire, the entire speech. My countrymen, the ship of state is safe. Ship of state, what's the metaphor? Okay, if it's a ship, where does it exist? It's on the sea. Okay, and now it's safe. In other words, the seas have died down. We're in harbor. The gods who rocked her, the state, after a long merciless pounding in the storm, have righted her once more. The storm isn't only the attack of Polynices. The storm is also the previous rule of Oedipus. Out of the whole city, I have called you here alone. That is, you should count yourselves fortunate. I consider you to be the wise men. Well, I know first your undeviating support for the throne and royal power of King Elias. That is, my predecessor, you loyally served. Then, after he was dead, Oedipus steered the land of Thebes. And even after he died, your loyalty was unshakable. You stood by their children. All right. Now then, since the two sons are dead, two blows of fate... As I am next in kin, because Yocasta is dead, Oedipus is dead, the two sons are dead, daughters can't be the rulers. So, me, I get the job. What did he say in the previous play? Yeah, come on, Oedipus, think about this. Would I really want your job? I mean, I get all the perks of power without the headaches. Now he's got the perks and the headaches. I... Now, look at the language, possess the throne and all its powers. What's possess mean? I own it. It's mine. He doesn't say, I inhabit the throne. Do presidents say, the White House is mine? No, they damn well better not. Because there will be a holy hell raid. If they do, right? Because they they what? They live there for how long? Four years or eight years? Or if you're Roosevelt, nearly 12 years, right? I now possess the throne and all its powers. What would happen if the speech ended right there? What does that sound like? I mean, people are worried about Trump being an autocrat. This is a dictator, okay? So he modifies of course you cannot know a man completely, his character, his principles, sense of judgment, not till he's shown his colors, ruling the people, making laws. That is as great an argument for why governors should run for president and be elected president as there is. Because governors are what? Executives. They hold the executive office of their particular state. So what does that mean? What have they had to do? They've had to show their character in their quote-unquote rule, their principles, their sense of judgment, and make laws. That's why senators almost never get elected president. Okay. Who was the last senator before um, Obama? 
JFK. Okay. JFK. And the only reason Johnson became president was because he was JFK's vice president. Prior to being vice president, what was he? He was a senator. Right? And we don't have many more before them. Almost all the others were former governors, with a few exceptions, obviously. So, experience, there's the test. What's the problem with Crayon saying this? Okay. He has no experience. What's the experience he has? Having all the perks, but none of the power. None of the delegated authority. Okay. It's, this is, you know, this is his inaugural address. He's standing up and saying, experience is what makes a great ruler. And the, the chorus can all go, um, and what's your experience exactly? I mean, look at presidential elections. Um, back in, uh, man, what year was that? 2007, I guess. Early 2008, when Obama was running, he was asked an awful lot. What's your experience? You know, community organizer, state senator, federal um, senator for how many years? Three, actually, before he ran for president. He was elected in 2004. Okay. He said, you know, I've run this campaign. I ran a campaign for president. Okay. Yeah, woo. What was, you know, Mitt Romney saying? I ran the Olympics. Okay. He was also a governor for four years. Jimmy Carter was a governor for four years, etc. What was What did Trump say? Or any of the other, you know, 20 dwarfs that were on the stage? Trump said, what? I ran an international business. I was a CEO. How is that any different than being president? Well, there's a little bit of difference because when you're a CEO of a privately held corporation, you do what? <laughs> Whatever you want, you call all the shots. You are the tyrant of that corporation. Okay? President, however, what did he come to discover at much to his chagrin? He's got 535 cats to herd. Because that's essentially what Congress is. Okay? Herding cats. And even the, you know, 300 who are of his herd <laughs> don't always agree with him, etc. So, experience. There's the test. As I see it, whoever assumes the task, the awesome task of setting the city's course, and refuses to adopt the soundest policies, but fearing someone keeps his lips locked tight, he's utterly worthless. What does he mean, fearing someone keeps his lips locked tight? I mean, again, I haven't read this play since the election, but it's, I'm, I'm hearing echoes of Trump here. What is he saying? If you don't say what you're thinking, because what is one of the, the uh, slams against most politicians? They say one thing to this audience, but this audience, they say something else. And then they say something completely different to this audience. And sometimes, depending upon the politician, they even vary how they speak. It's really great. Go back to listen. Listen to Hillary Clinton and some of her speeches. Talking to people in New York and then talking to people in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, etc. She starts bringing in all these y'alls and dropping the G's, etc. Okay? It's kind of what he's getting at there. But what else does he mean by keeping his lips locked tight? Being this kind of politician. Where's the wind blowing? Where, what do the polls say? So I rate him now, I always have. That is, someone who pays only attention to the polls. Someone who doesn't operate on the basis of principles. He's utterly worthless. And whoever places a friend above the good of his own country, he is nothing. Okay? So, a leader who puts his friends in positions of power, nepotism, or family, 
What was the, one of the problems JFK had? He made his brother attorney general. Okay, can you imagine if a president today, if Trump tried to make, he doesn't have a brother, um, he's dead, <laughs> but if Trump tried to make a brother attorney general, can you imagine if Obama had named Michelle Obama attorney general? Okay, first of all, he couldn't have. Why? Because Congress passed the law after JOK, uh, JFK named Robert to be attorney general that said, you can't do that. Okay? Which is why Trump can have, uh, Obama can have Michelle Obama as an advisor. Trump can have Jared uh, Kushner and his daughter as advisors, but they can't be named to cabinet positions. Okay? There's an actual law against it. So he's saying, but someone who would put his friend in a position of power, I have no use for him. What would that do for many of our past presidents and ambassadorships? You know, because ambassadors are FOBs, friends of Bill, friends of Brock, uh, FODs, friends of Donald, FOGs, friends of George, you know, that kind of thing. So he says, Zeus is my witness. As Zeus is my witness, I could never stand by silent, watching destruction march against our city, putting safety to rout. Remember this, our country is our safety. If the country's strong, we will individually be strong, and we will be safe. So he says, here's the proclamation I've just made. Closely akin to these standards, I have proclaimed just now the following decree to our people concerning the two sons of Oedipus. Ateocles, who died fighting for Thebes, excelling all in arms, he shall be buried, crowned with the hero's honors. The cups we pour to soak the earth and reach the famous dead. Kind of to placate him. But as for his blood brother, Polynices, who returned from exile, home to his father's city, and the gods of his race, consumed with one desire, to burn them, roof to roots. That is, he wanted to burn the temples of our gods. That man, a proclamation, has forbidden the city to dignify him with burial, mourn him at all. No, he must be left unburied, his corpse carrying for the birds and dogs to tear, an obscenity for the citizens to behold. Because what does that mean? If you read the previous footnote in one of the earlier pages, it means then, Polynices' soul, when it goes down to Hades, will be shunned by the dead. He'll not be going off and drinking with Atreus and Agamemnon. And, you know. These are my principles. Never at my hands will the traitor be honored above the patriot. Whoever proves his loyalty to the state, I'll prize that man in death. And the leader. It's not a full-throated, you know, applause. It's well, if this is your pleasure, Crayon, treating our city's enemy and friend this way, dot, dot, dot. What's the dot, dot, dot mean? No. Reluctance, exactly. It's kind of like, well, you know, you might not want to go there. I mean... The power is yours. Next two words. I suppose. To enforce it with the laws. Both for the dead and all of us the living. Laws are meant for what? The living. Because dead men don't break the laws. What is the leader saying? No, I suppose the law is yours for the dead. If the law is crayons for the dead, then what does that do to crayon? How, what does it do to his standing? It elevates him. It makes him godlike. Only the gods have control or influence over the dead. So, follow my orders closely. Be on your guard. Whoa, 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 we're too old. That, that's, you know, you got to put that on younger shoulders. He says, no, not for you. I've already posted the garden. Okay, so what about for us? What, what other service? 
See that you never side with those who break my orders. In other words, stand with me. Only a fool would do otherwise. Death is the price. You're right, but all too often the mere hope of money has ruined many men. And this is where he introduces this idea. Money, profit, okay, has forced men to do things they otherwise wouldn't do. Okay? Sentry runs in. And notice how long it takes the sentry to get to the point. Why? Why is he hesitant to speak? Of? Because what happens all too often? <laughs> they shoot the messenger. It's exactly right. Okay, he says, "I didn't do it." Seven uh, two sixty nine. First, myself, I've got to tell you, I didn't do it. Didn't see who did. Don't take it on to me. What are you talking about? You get it. Uh, somebody buried him. The body. Someone's just buried it. Then run off. Sprinkle some dry dust. Giving it proper rights. See, burial doesn't mean six feet. Cement thing, wooden casket. It just means sprinkling a little dust over the ground, saying the appropriate prayers, pouring out a little bit of wine. What man alive would dare? Notice the assumption there. No idea. It wasn't me, though. <laughs> Sentry, you know. He says, just at sunup. First watch of the day points it out. It was a wonder. We were stunned. Terrific burden, too, for all of us. You know, you can't see the corpse, not that it's buried, but there's a light cover of road dust on it. What does the leader of the chorus suggest? And why does the leader of the chorus suggest that? Line 315 or so. My king, ever since he began, I've been debating in my mind, could this possibly be the work of the gods? Why does the chorus suggest that? Because the chorus still isn't happy with this proclamation. Because the chorus knows it is, as Antigone will say in a few pages, it is an unwritten tradition of the gods. You bury the dead. doesn't matter whether they're your dead or your enemy's dead. You bury the dead. The dead have certain rights. Okay? Not because if you don't bury the dead or don't give them their proper rights, they're going to come back and haunt you, as in, you know, stuff in the Middle Ages. Or they're going to come back as vampires and such. Cramp, stop! Before you choke me with anger, the gods, the gods, look at your footnote. The course of surmise about divine intervention in this first burial is conceivably true. That is... Might the gods have raised the dust to go over Polynices' body? Have we been told yet that Antigone has already been to the body to sprinkle the dust? No, we have not. She'll be caught in the act later. Okay. So he's like, the gods, why in the world? But you're senile. Must you also be insane? Slamming them for their age. It's intolerable to say the gods could have the slightest concern for that corpse. But again, what is he arrogating to himself? He knows what the gods think and what they believe. Why? For meritorious service? Is that why they buried him? The one who came to burn their temples? When did you last see the gods celebrating traitors? Okay, maybe not traitors, but Orestes? Inconceivable. No, from the first, there were certain citizens who could hardly stand the spirit of my regime, channeling his inner Nixon here, you know, grumbling against me in the dark, heads together, tossing wildly, never keeping their necks beneath the yoke. What's he talking about? Or what's he betraying or demonstrating? 
All presidents have this to some extent. Paranoia. They don't want me to be president. They disagree with the election. And the they is not necessarily the same they. It could be a wide variety. Okay? He's showing his paranoia here. There are certain people grumbling in the dark. He's suggesting trying to undermine my rule. And what has caused them? Money. <laughs> Nothing worse in our lives. So current, rampant, so corrupting. They've been bought off. No, those people who have been whispering in the dark did what? They bribed somebody to do the burial. So he turns on the sentry. Just like what? And? You're right. Oedipus and Tiresias. Oedipus and Crayon. You, if you don't find the man who buried that corpse, he says, <coughs> I'll bring the punishment on you, because he's going to go on and suggest, I think you did it. I swear to Zeus, as I still believe in Zeus, if you don't find the man who buried that corpse, the very man, and produce him before my eyes, simple death won't be enough for you. Not till we string you up alive and wring the immor immort immorality. Out of you. Sentry, can, can, can I, just one word before I go? Everything you say offends me. Where does it hurt you, in the ears or in the heart? The culprit grates on your feelings. I just annoy your ears. In other words, the person who did the burying, that's the one who stung you to the heart. You just don't like my words. Okay? So, just before the sentry leaves, the sentry says three 65 or so, it's terrible when the one who does the judging judges things all wrong. You could almost have used that at the end of Oedipus, because what happens? Oedipus judges entirely wrong when he's told the murder of Lys is in the city. Oh, well, then it must be Tiresias or Crayon or... Okay. So the sentry says, I hope he's found. Best thing by far. Caught or not. That's in the lap of fortune. Remember fortune's wheel always turning? But I'll never come back. Seen the last of me. I'm saved even now, and I never thought, I never hoped. Dear gods, I owe you all my thanks. He says, I hope the bad guy's caught, but I'm not going to be the one to bring you news of that. Chorus. Now keep in mind, in Sophocles' plays, the chorus often serves what function? Not only are they part of the dialogue, but what else? They comment on the action. Numberless wonders, terrible wonders, walk the world, but none the match for man. Why does the Chorus introduce this reverie, almost, on the wonders of man? This is like Shakespeare's, you know. Oh, what a wonderless, what a peerless thing is man. Paragon of the world, etc. Right? That great wonder that is man crossing the heaving gray sea. And what else? He wears away the oldest of the gods, the world, the earth, by walking, by farming. What else? He conquers the birds and the animals with speech and thought, quick as the wind and the mood and the mind for law that rules the city. All these he's taught himself in shelter from the arrows of the frost. In other words, man has done what? Conquered everything. Conquers the physical world, conquers all the birds, beasts, animals, etc. And even conquers, controls his mind, his thoughts. Man, line 405 or so. The master. Ingenious past all measure. Past all dreams, the skills within his grasp, he forges on now to destruction, now to greatness. When he weaves in the laws of the land and the justice of the gods that binds his oaths together, laws of the land, oaths of the gods, and he binds them together, what does he then do? He inextricably links himself to what the gods 
desire. He and his city rise high. And I think what the chorus means by the binding of the two laws, when he makes his laws subject to the gods, that is, obeys the gods' will, then the city is blessed. But the city casts out that man who weds himself to inhumanity. How? Thanks to reckless daring. What's the reckless daring? Reckless is thoughtless, remember, without consideration. The one? Oh, are, are they, is the chorus anti That's what it seems like. Not necessarily. I mean, they, they are in the sense of he shouldn't have attacked the city. They're not necessarily anti polynices in the sense of he doesn't deserve to be buried. Okay. The chorus is the chorus is what choruses often are, even in our real world, even though we don't tend to think that we have choruses. We do. Okay. In a presidential presidential administration, who or what is the chorus? No, it's not the people who don't vote. I mean, in the administration. Okay, it's the leader of the chorus and the rest of the chorus. In most administrations, you've got to admit the Trump one's a little out of the ordinary. The cabinet, who generally do what? Agree with everything the president says. This, why I said, this is one a little bit different because it's like Trump says one thing and a member of the cabinet says something totally opposite. Wait a second, you're supposed to agree with this person. You're violating the great tragic, you know, tradition. They all need to go back to school. <laughs> um, the chorus is kind of suggesting here, with the comment about reckless daring, when you pass laws, you assert laws that do what? Take something away from the laws of the gods, or take something away from the rights of the gods. Okay? We've already discussed, and we've seen in other plays, the gods control pretty much the dead, those dealing with the dead. All right? What has Crayon said? Not in my town they don't. I control what happens to the dead. All right? So Antigone comes in. Led by a sentry. The sentry, excuse me, the same one who left previously. Here is a dark sign from the gods. What to make of this? Now, what does the chorus mean by that? Well, golly gee, we just don't know what this means. But it should be pretty obvious, isn't it? I, I know her. That's, that's Antigone. Wretched child of a wretched father. Is it possible? Uh, her? She looks like a prisoner. Depending on how the play is directed, Antigone can be led in, in chains, or she can just be led in walking beside the sentry. Obviously, if Antigone is led in with hand and leg irons, you know she's not free. But if she and the sentry are kind of skipping, you know, happy-go-lucky in, it, that's a totally different thing. Did you break the king's laws? Did they take you in some act of mad defiance? Sentry. She did it. Single-handedly. Caught her bearing the body. Where's Crayon? That is, get him out of here. Crayon comes out. Sentry. 436 or so. I'm bringing in our prisoner, this young girl. We took her giving the dead the last rites. No casting lots this time. That is, last time he said, I had to be the one to come. Why? Because I got the short end of the stick. No, this time I chose to come. Why? I'm clean, man. Not guilty. Now, my lord, here she is. Take her, question her, cross-examine. Her? You took her? Where? Doing what? Okay, was the sentry not clear before? Burying the man. That's the whole story. What? Right. 
Crayon, open your ears, man. I'm telling you. You mean what you say? You're telling the truth? And I was, you know, getting Monty Python or somebody else doing this, and the sentry would say, read my lips. <laughs> I'll speak it slowly for you. <coughs> She's the one. With my own eyes I saw her bury the body. Just what you forbidden. There. Is that plain and clear? What did you see? <laughs> Why does Crayon do this? Well, he can't believe that she possibly could have done this. Why? Well, she's a girl. She's, she's a she. A first, first of all, why else? I mean, that's definitely right. There's more to it, though. Because it's dishonorable to Eteocles, okay, her brother, bear in mind, and cousin, just don't go there, it screws up my mind too much. She's going to marry his son, Haman, okay. So she's supposed to be on Crayon's side. Kind of. What, else, what a relation is Antigone to Crayon? I don't, yeah, I get all mixed up here. Niece and what? Second cousin? Or first cousin once removed or something like that? It's you is the relationship, <laughs> you know. So what did you see? Did you catch her in the act? Sentry's like, man, okay. We went back. We brushed the corpse clean. Again, you. <laughs> we stripped it bare, took all the clothing off of it. It was slimy, going soft. Yeah, he'd been dead for several hours. And we took the high ground back to the wind, so the stink of him couldn't hit us. So we got upwind of Polynices' body. I mean, this is grease. It's probably 80, 90 degrees. It's, you know. And we waited. He says, the hours dragged by, the sun rose, sun started to set. And then it happened. Suddenly, a whirlwind, twisting a great dust storm up from the earth, a black plague of the heavens filling the plain, ripping the leaves off every tree in sight. So, it's not winter, because there are leaves. It's probably summer, and the whirlwind comes up. What does a whirlwind get in it? Dust. So, maybe that's how the body was buried the first time. And he says, and when the storm passed, there she was. She cried out a sharp, piercing cry, like a bird come back to an empty nest. Just so, when she sees the corpse bare, she bursts into a long, shattering wail, calls down withering curses on the heads of all who did the work, that is, me and the other sentries, and she scoops up dry dust, handfuls, quickly. She's sitting there doing this, just spreading it over the body. And lifting a fine bronze urn, lifting it high and pouring, she crowns the dead with three full libations. Kind of like one pours it out a bunch, two pours out a bunch, three pours out a bunch on his body. Okay? We grabbed her, we interrogated her, charging her with offenses, past and present. Notice, well, she did it this time. They jumped to the conclusion she's responsible for the previous dusting. She stood up to it all, denied nothing. That doesn't mean, however, it's not a fact that she buried him the first time. She might merely be taking credit for it. You know, in for a penny, in for a pound kind of a thing. I tell you, it made me ache and laugh in the same breath. Crayon, wheeling on Antigone. He's been looking at the sentry, and now he turns on her like he's about to slaughter her. You! With your eyes fixed on the ground. Why does she have her eyes fixed on the ground? What does that usually imply? Shame. She's, you know, little calm, light, demure, Antigone. Okay. Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, asks him, why show you your veiled lids to us? Because he's looking at the ground and his eyes look closed to their perspective. Okay? Do you deny you did this? Yes or no? 
Why ask her the question when the sentry's already told him she did it? He still can't believe it? Is there another reason, possibly? Well, it's not really fair to not get it from her. Okay. Louder. He doesn't want to have to kill her. She's blood relation to him. She's soon to be more than blood relation to him. In the sense of her, she's going to marry whatever H Haman's relation is to her now. Okay. You can imagine the kids they're going to have. Mm. Okay. I did it. I don't deny a thing. Crayon to the sentry. Yeah. Tell me briefly. Notice the and I know it's just words, but if you can, is there any kind of tone in crayons in these initial kind of speeches with Antigone? It, does he come across, for example, with, you, tell me briefly, no long speeches. Were you aware a decree had forbidden this? Is it that? Or is it, okay, calm down. I think that the tone is, he's being gentle. At first, he's trying to find, I think, some kind of loophole that he can let her off. Um, were you aware a decree had forbidden this? What has he just given her? Great big massive doorway that she could run right through. You mean it was forbidden? Oh, my golly gee, Mr. Crayon, I didn't know that. Would his manie run through that door? Hell yes. Okay. Well aware. How could I avoid it? It was public. Scratch one. And still you had the gall to break this law? Of course I did. Okay. In the following lines, look at that footnote. Antigone states her creed. Now, you don't have to believe the footnotes when they're opinion-based rather than fact-based. This is opinion-based, okay? Compare Crayon's maxim in lines 203-05, which I believe are the lines about experience and such. Whoever places a friend above the good of his own country, he is nothing, I have no use for him. She has placed a friend, her brother, above the good of the country, okay? Uh, both antagonists, Antagonists can cite religious or political principles. A major question in the play is whether Antigone and Crayon are actually governed by these large principles or by more personal motives, good or bad. So, she says, It wasn't Zeus, not in the least, who made this proclamation, not to me, nor did that justice dwelling with the gods beneath the earth ordain such laws for men. She is saying that proclamation is what? A human law. What can happen with every human law? It can get changed. Chicago last year passed a big old massive tax on soft drinks. Just a couple weeks ago, they repealed it. Why? Higher taxes don't always mean more income for the taxing body. Because lots of times people are smart and they stop buying those things. Okay? Yeah. Was, that, was it the goal to get income or to stop, stop yeah. from drinking soft drinks? Isn't that supposed to be more for I don't know what their purpose was behind it, but they yeah. repealed it. Yeah. For whatever the purpose was, it wasn't working. Okay? Put it that way. So, um, you know, should I go there because we don't have time? Not with that. You know, Congress several years ago started raising taxes on cigarettes and other tobacco products. For what purpose? Uh, smoking's bad for you. We don't want people to smoke. We especially don't want teenagers to start smoking. And yet, what did they stipulate would be done with the taxes that were raised on cigarettes? It would all go to anti-smoking programs. Okay, now think about the logic of this for a moment. So you raise taxes to stop people from smoking, thinking the money you're raising is going to go for programs to stop people from smoking. But you stop people from smoking 
and they stop paying the taxes that are going to go It's Congress, I mean. Unless you're essentially paying for that with blood money from the people who are smoking. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, plus the money's used for, you know, supposedly for other things, and then when the money's not raised, you got to find some other cash cow to, you know, do that. So she goes on. Nor did I think your edict had such force that you, a mere mortal, could override the gods. The great, unwritten, unshakable traditions. Okay? King kings, leaders, presidents, etc., do things that go against the unwritten, unshakable traditions. Do we have an unwritten, unshakable tradition in the United States? I've never asked this question. I've been teaching this thing for nearly 30 years. I've never asked that question. I shouldn't until I think about it. <laughs> I think we probably do. Could a president pass a law? Could Congress pass a law that violates that? Well, a lot of people say Congress already has all kinds of laws. Okay, I don't want X percentage of my taxes going to this thing because it violates a tradition or it violates my conscience because that's what she means by the great unshakable traditions. Kind of the laws of conscience. They are alive. Who's the they? These traditions. Not just today or yesterday. They live forever. Okay, so what would be a great unshakable tradition? I think everybody in here would agree with this. Even though it's not necessarily, it is, but it's not necessarily inscribed in a law. Laws against murder. Right? Does it really have to be in the penal code? Thou shalt not murder. Why? Everybody, even without the written law, understands. All cultures, by the way, this is one of those things that is universal, that it's never right to murder. I'm not saying kill somebody in self-defense. That's different. That's not murder. Murder is always what? Premeditated, man. It's planned. It's, you set everything in motion, and then you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kill the person. It's not, you know, somebody comes, tries to steal your car with you in it, and, you know, you accidentally run over them or something. Well, maybe not accidentally, but, okay. So she goes on. Um, these laws, I was not about to break them, not out of fear of some man's wounded pride and face the retribution of the gods. Notice, if I obey your laws, who do I face? The gods. Whose punishment's worse? The gods. Yeah, you know, because you know, they do things like have your liver ripped out for eternity and put you in, you know, uh, think Tantalus and all those fun things. Okay? Die I must. I've known it all my life. Right? Everybody has to die. How could I keep from knowing? Even without your death sentence ringing in my ears. In other words, she's saying... Your death sentence means nothing. Why? Because I'm going to die anyways. You're just doing what for my death? You're speeding it up. Okay. If you saw the winner's tale, you saw that great scene when Hermione delivers her court scene, her speech in her defense at the trial. And she says, when Leontes says, you're going to die, she goes, do you really think I have a whole lot to live for? One child dead, one child ripped away from me, publicly shamed and humiliated as a, essentially a whore. You, you don't think I'm not looking forward to death? Okay. And if I am to die before my time, she says, 5, 15 or so, I consider that a gain. Who on earth, alive in the midst of so much grief as I, could fail to find his death a rich reward? Remember how I said that line in Oedipus the King should be translated? Count no man blessed until he is dead. She's saying, actually, you, you kill me, that would be a blessing to me. So, to meet this doom of yours is precious little pain. Leader, a 
like father, like daughter. <laughs> In other words, she just doesn't know when to shut up. Passionate, wild. Theme, she hasn't learned to bend before adversity. Aesop's fable of the oak and the reed. What happens to the reed in the wind? It bends and then it comes back. The oak, wham, it's gone. Okay? What's the wind? Adversity. Being able to overcome it. Crayon. No? no that is, no, she hasn't learned to bend before adversity? Oh, just wait. Believe me, little dramatic irony here, by the way, the stiffest stubborn wills fall the hardest. And the audience is sitting out there going, <laughs> oh, is he going to get it? Because they know exactly what's coming. The whole myth of Oedipus and his family existed long before Sophocles. The toughest iron tempered strong in the white hot fire, you'll see it crack. This girl was an old hand at insolence when she overrode the edicts. But now listen to what he says. But once she done it, that's bad enough. But to glory in it, the implication is almost, I'm not saying he would do this, that if she said, yes, I did it, I'm sorry. But, I mean, he's my brother. What, what can but she goes beyond that. She revels in it. She says, the gods will bless me for having done this. Mocking us to our face with what she done? I am not the man. Not now. She is the man if this victory goes. In other words, she, if I don't follow through on my sentence, she will emasculate me. It's getting personal for Creon. Nope, she won't escape. Nor her sister either. Yeah, I think her sister was involved. Antigone, Crayon, what do you want more than my arrest? And what more do you want than my arrest and execution? Nothing. I, I, then why delay? In other words, quit yapping. Your moralizing repels me. Every word you say, pray God it always will. So everything I say repels you too. Give me glory. Notice, are Antigone's actions entirely non-selfish? No, they're not. There is some selfishness here. What greater glory could I win than to give my own brother decent burial? And she says, and these citizens here, points to the chorus, They'd agree with me, too, if they weren't all chicken, you know what? He says, no, you're the only one in Thebes who thinks like this. No, sorry, I'm not. He says, aren't you ashamed? Not for a moment. But Ateocles was a brother. What about him? She says, yep, brother by the same mother, same father. Well, then how can you bury the brother who killed him? Because Ateocles will never argue against that. What? Antiochus died fighting in our behalf, he says. Doesn't matter. Death longs for the same rights for all. Haven't you read your Iliad, Crayon? <laughs> How Hector had to be buried? Never the same for the patriot and the traitor. Patriot and the traitors, complete opposite. Who, Crayon, Antigone says, can say the ones below don't find this pure and uncorrupt? That is, this dead body. What is, what is she saying? Once somebody's dead, one is no longer what? Traitor. <laughs> Once somebody's dead, one's no longer a criminal. One's just dead. She is suggesting there is something about the body itself that is sacred, okay? Never. Once an enemy, never a friend. Not even in death. Well, that's not true. Because you read Greek accounts of people going, or Roman accounts, in the case of Virgil, of people going to the underworld, and what happens? 
You see in the underworld in Hades, men who had been enemies on earth, now, okay, they're not having fun, because there is no fun in Hades, but they're not at it hammer and tongs against each other. Why? Because they're all in the same boat at that point. Crayon, while I'm alive, no woman is going to lord it over me. So as Meany is brought in, she says, yes, I did it too. Antigone says, no, you didn't. You're not taking some of my glory away. So Crayon says, Antigone will die. But we'll let as many live. Leader, page 813, line 649 or so. So, I don't know why it's taking me so long. So it's settled then? Antigone must die? Question mark? Yes. Okay. Your, your decision. And that's when the, the chorus brings up, beginning 668 or so, Things about the ancestral problems of the house. Uh, it goes back to Pelops. And after that long speech by the chorus, Haman comes in. What does Haman try to get his father to see? One, he is alone in this thought. That is, the people of the city don't agree with him. Right? He also says, I'm your son, I love you, I agree with you most of the time, unless you do something stupid, okay, and Crayon warns him against women and their wiles, you know, that, you know, the softness of a woman, all that, he says, son, don't let that blind your mind. He says, because if anyone steps out of line, 745 or so, if anyone steps out of line, violates the laws, or presumes to hand out orders to a superior, so window no praise for me. Skip a few lines. Anarchy. Show me a greater crime in all the earth. That is, anybody who goes against me is an anarchist. What does anarchy literally mean? The a ah or an means against. Archie, authority. It's anti-authority. Well, you have a king saying, anybody who's against authority is obviously against me, so. And the leader says, you know, you guys are both speaking wisdom. I, I, I like what, what's the leader showing? Spinelessness. Won't take a position. Doesn't want to offend Crayon. Doesn't want to offend Haman. And we're out of time. So we'll pick up here and finish this on Thursday after fall break, which we also have for that day. Um, Plato's Allegory of the Cave and the Apology of Socrates. So we're going to end up being a little compressed for time, but we'll do our best. Allegory of the cave.